Brandon Nguyen will kick it off. Nate Stefanski and Chase Witte back deep to receive. And the second half is underway. Stefanski will field it at the 17. Looking for room. Very patient, but nothing opens up. He's out to the 30. We'll see what adjustments uh, Coach Devilak came up here, came up with at halftime. I know the coaches more or less sprint to the locker room and sprint to the offices and really start, you know, pouring over the notes, pouring over the film and seeing what they can find, what little seam they can find in this Carnegie Mellon defense. And like I said, we'll see if they can, you know, find something that they can exploit. Drew Saxon held under 50% passing in the first half, 14 of 29, 185 yards, but the big number, he was dropped three times. Saxton in the shotgun. Give to Hall. Up the middle, there's the seam. And he'll get near the first down marker, a gain of nine. Probably one of the better runs of the night on the on the first play of the second half here. We'll see if Zach Hall can get a little, get in a little rhythm here. Slicing through up the gut in behind center Chase Strayer. A little delay handoff on second down. It's a first. Tripped up near midfield. You know, one of the benefits of having kind of a running back rotation is you do keep guys fresh. One of the negatives is it can be tough to get in a rhythm. You see Zach Hall coming out after two plays here. It just, you know, you kind of got to stay into it mentally and just realize that when you're in there, it's your time and, you know, you got to make the most of it. So Donald Day the third will check in on first down from the 48. Saxton claps the hands. It's on the ground again. Day looking for the hole. He's got some daylight and spins free. A first down inside the 30. Day, not the biggest guy, but you wouldn't know it by looking at that run. Broke two or three Carnegie Mellon tackles there. Huge runs here to start the second half for the Case offense. His legs just keep on churning throughout the run. Nice to see Colt Morgan there also blocking downfield. You know, the line is really the start of the run plays, but if you want the big 20, 30-yard runs, you need good blocking from your receivers. The Spartan offense grooving early on. First drive of the second half. On the ground they go again, and Day, maybe for a loss of one. Plushko, you know, kind of got fed up here with these runs and <laughs> definitely inserted himself into the run support there. Blew that thing up. Thomas Palachko, the junior, has been so instrumental in the pass defense game. Second and 11. Day still out there. So is Turkovsky. We haven't seen this two-back set all that much tonight. Looks like we have single coverage here at the bottom with Colt Morgan. Colt at the bottom of your screen. Saxton looking his way. Deep, tripped up, and there goes the flag. You can argue that there was incidental contact, that you know the defender just kind of tripped and Colt fell over him, but it's probably not going to hold up in the, in the court of public opinion here with the refs. There's Anthony Kennan, and you see him grabbing at the left ankle of Colt Morgan. Yeah, it's tough. You know, as a DB, if you get beat like that, you got to make a call. Are you going to you know, let the receiver kind of walk into the end zone with a free touchdown there, or are you going to make him earn it? And you know, Carnegie Mellon here is... They're going to put their bend but don't break pr uh, principle here to the test. Nick Sizik was coming over to help on the coverage, but it was Kennan who got flagged. Take one more look at it. That was Kennan going to ground. The ball went off of Sizik, who was trying to pick it. First and 10 from the 14. Hall returns to the backfield. Saxton, little bubble screen. This is Morgan shifting, shaking, and diving into the end zone. Won't be denied. Nice to see the lineman out there like we talked about earlier. Nice athletic lineman getting out, throwing blocks, getting in the way of the defenders, and Colt Morgan does the rest. That nifty little footwork. As soon as he caught that ball, Colt Morgan planted that right foot, exploded back to the middle of the field, and he really had to break one more arm tackle before he was in for six. Case's offense for years now has really, really liked to use the bubble screen or, the, you know, those tunnel screens down there in, in the red zone. Probably use them, you know, more than most teams do. And the reason they, they keep going back to it is because they block it well and it works. Spartans with a 10-point lead. The first drive 
of this second half is a touchdown to Colt Morgan. And what do you know, Drew Saxton has tied Dan Whalen's 2009 single season passing touchdown record. The freshman Saxton tied with one of the greats in this program's history, Dan Whalen, for the most TDs by a quarterback in a single season in Spartan history. They each have 34. Yeah, pretty, pretty crazy. You know, Drew Saxon as a freshman is, you know, tying and hopefully breaking the record of Dan Whalen here in a little bit. And, you know, Dan Whalen, as we talked about, one of the, you know, truly program greats, the 2007 to 2009 teams, 30 and 0 regular seasons. And, you know, Dan Whalen was a huge part of that. So pretty cool to see Drew Saxon, you know, get up in the same echelon with that guy. Case 20, Carnegie Mellon 10. That was a big drive to open up the half by the Spartans. Willie Richter, so dangerous on the return. And he gets wrapped up immediately by Travis Johnston. Cool fact about Travis in high school. Now think about this. Each year of his four-year career, 100 tackles, 1,000 yards rushing. How many guys can say that in the state of Ohio? So pretty impressive high school career. And, you know, he's another guy that made a huge leap from his freshman to sophomore year here at Case. And... You know, it's good to see him continuing to grow as a football player. Former two-way player, two-time All-Ohio first team as a linebacker. He was an All-Ohio second team selection as a running back in 2014 as well. Klein on the run pass option. He'll keep it, and he'll slide for a first down. We have not seen that very much from Carnegie Mellon, even though it's historically been a staple of their offense. I'll be honest. I was completely fooled on that play. thought... Thought Haas, number five, had the ball, and Klein spits out the back. And, you know, that might be something that the, the Carnegie coaches saw at halftime, realized that they could they could work that into the fold here, and, you know, so far so good with it. Chris Haas, again, the main running back tonight, no Roy Hubbard. That one's picked off. Kevin Chris is his second of the night. Unbelievable. I said it earlier, the kid makes plays. He just has a knack for finding the football, making a big tackle, pick six, anything. If you need it, he's got it. Chris is very passionate player, probably going to let you know about it when he beats you, and, you know, that's what makes him so good. He's got a very fiery personality, and it shows in his play. And, again, coming up with a huge play for the defense, setting up the offense in the opposition's territory. So Drew Saxton leading this offense back on the field. He just tied Dan Whalen's single season passing touchdown record. The freshman is now even with one of the all time greats in case quarterback history. Saxton dropping back, looking to Morgan. And that one's picked by the Tartans. Case punches, Carnegie punches back, what do you know? Anthony Kennan with the interception and it goes back the other way. A reminder, by the way, that the second half of this game is presented by Dave's Cosmic Subs, proud sponsor of Spartans football. So Alex Klein will get back on the field, each quarterback throwing an interception on back-to-back -back plays, and both to number 20, as it would happen. Kevin Chris is for the Spartans, Anthony Kennan for the Tartans. First and 10 from the 12. Nice little play by Kennan to slip under Colt Morgan to make that play. There's the give to Haas, little counter. He can't shake free, gain of about three yards. Do you think we see more of that run pass option after it was so successful? Because it, it almost looks like Carnegie Mellon pocketed that play until the second half. Yeah, I mean, I would hope so. I would hope the plays that you know, you have success with, you come back to, and we'll see. Klein, he's not a super mobile quarterback. I wouldn't necessarily call him dual threat, but when, you know, when it's there, when there's 10 yards there, he's absolutely going to take it. Second and six from their own 16. Handoff. Haas has a little hole, wiggles through, and has the first down. Boy, he has been so impressive for being the number two back pressed into action. Yeah, he. I mean, he runs hard. He's... He's got a solid line up in front of him. We got, you know, Coombe goes in motion, it seems like, every single play and is butting heads with the linebackers and clearing out holes for him. But, 
Haas takes what's given and, you know, earns even a little bit more. It's not necessarily the first guy bringing him down. Spartans 20, Tartans 10. Opening few ticks of the second half. There's Coombe in motion again. Fake handoff, slid over the middle, and this is for Coombe. Love that play for, for you Cleveland Browns fans out there. You saw something similar with Baker Mayfield and David and Joku. Kind of a, you know, kind of a read option with the quarterback, and he's going to pull it out and sling it to the tight end real quickly there, and it's really tough to defend, especially when they've been pounding the rock on that play. Part of the reason that play's effective, I would think, is because the linebacker bites, and that opens that space. Yep, absolutely. Here's Haas, off right tackle. Boy, he's been slippery. That's another first down. You know, both teams kind of struggled a little bit in the first half running the ball, and it seemed to open up here. And, you know, like we've mentioned a couple times, football's a game of adjustments. And these are both – both teams are very well coached. Coaching staffs have been here for a very long time, and they know what it takes. They – they know how to break down film. They know they know how to find gaps in the defense and exploit it. Watch out for Carnegie Mellon, too. You look at their last four games, three of them have been decided by four points or fewer. Now, they're one and two in those games, but they have experience in tight contests where Case really doesn't here. Yeah, Case coming into this game averaging 40 points, only giving up 16. You know, they did have the one loss to Washington and Jefferson kind of in the middle of the year, but other than that, they haven't really been tested a whole lot, and you know, sometimes that can become an issue. Sometimes it's more relevant. But, I mean, for the time being, we do have a close game here. And with it being a rivalry game, there's going to be pressure. you got to be able to respond to it. Second and one, Chris Haas feels like he's running downhill in this drive. He'll go to the left of Alex Klein. It feels really condensed here on the left side. Nobody outside the hash for Carnegie. Coombe to the left. And off Haas. He's got the first, didn't get much, but got enough out to the Spartans' 40. At what point do you think these little inside runs by Haas set up a play action and a deep ball? Well, you know, part of the whole idea about that is that I, I don't know when it's coming, and I don't know when the defense doesn't know, and that's kind of the whole concept behind it. At some point, they're going to pull that out and – hopefully find someone streaking down the sideline but like I said it's kind of the uncertainty that keeps you on edge it's Haas again big hit there from 51 Skyler Watt is coming across the sophomore out of Clovis New Mexico his dad a former football player at the Air Force Academy tell you what when you hit Skyler or when he hits you you feel it you feel it then and you're gonna feel it for a couple seconds after that the kid is solid you know, he's taking care of business in the weight room, and he's a good football player. He is built like a brick, 5'9", but 205 pounds. Second and nine from the 39 for Klein. And off Haas. Waiting, and the ball pops loose. A scrum on the turf, and the Tartans think they have it. Yeah. Looks like they do. Here we go. At least one Spartan had a shot at it. It'll stay with Carnegie Mellon. That's Chris is near it. Crossy taking a stab at it. Really a good effort by the lineman to get in there and grab it. Looked like Bram Miller, the sophomore, who recovered it. Out of Colgate, Wisconsin. And Kettle Moraine Lutheran. Third and three from the 33 after that spill by Haas, who otherwise has been great in this drive. Haas tripped up there by Crossy, who got him on the ankle, but it's going to be enough for a first down. You feel the crowd getting into this now. The stands below us are just thundering. Mm -hmm. Our great crew back again for one more week this year. Brian Trail, Kevin Gibson on the cameras, Brian Landers on video replay, and Mike Becker is our director. Coom in motion. Hand off. Slipping and sliding on through was Sean Cook on his first touch of the night. You know, and I haven't necessarily seen Cook carry the ball before, but because the offensive line's moving people, because Coom is blowing people out of there, it doesn't really matter who they give the ball to. They're going to get in, they're going to run hard, and they're going to gain positive yards. 
And I think you need to give Haas a bit of a break too. He has been carrying the the bulk of the load in this drive. Worth noting, we haven't really seen Rory Hubbard yet. Um, you know, have to wonder if the injury's taking its toll or if they're just kind of, I don't know, conserving him at some point. And around Willie Richter tripped up. I don't know who got a hand on him, but Richter looked like he was gone. And then he just fell at about the 10. Carney really using the whole width of the field there on that play, making the linebackers and safeties run, and, you know, they found a little seam in there. And that was the Haas run. Willie Richter just off your screen at the top on that end around. Sets up first and goal from the eight. There's a handoff, off left tackle to the pylon, and Haas is in. Really impressive drive by Carnegie. If you think back, Kevin Chris has had the interception for Case. Drew Saxon gives it right back to the Tartans, and what do you know? Back to, well, four-point score, or four, four-point game currently. We'll see if they can, you know, convert on the extra point, but... Like I said, folks, you better strap in. This second half is going to be a little crazy here, a little back and forth if it if it goes anything like the first half. Brandon Nguyen on the PAT. And that one goes off the upright. No good from Brandon Nguyen. It hit off the top of the right upright, right by the orange flag and flew wide. So it's still a four point game. That's a big missed PAT and the Spartans lead by four. We'll see if that comes back. Intercontinental Suites has been transformed into much more than a hotel. It is a center of wellness and tranquility, featuring renovated suites, an expanded fitness center, and pure rooms for guests requiring the most allergen-resistant rooms on the market. C2, our Mediterranean-style restaurant and bar, accentuates the ambiance of relaxation and rejuvenation. Chef Omar Jones has designed a menu full of fresh, locally grown herbs and vegetables, along with a flavorful cuisine inspired by the beneficial Mediterranean diet. Call the Intercontinental today at 216 707 or visit us at hotelsclevelandclinic.com or on Facebook. Back here, four-point game. We're seeing a replay of the touchdown. Coombe really did a good job of picking up the linebacker. Crossing number five, reaching, tried to get out there. Haas, as he's been doing all night, not letting the first guy bring him down. Carnegie continues to fight and stay in this game. Chris Haas with the touchdown, a nice block by Carl Coombe to pick up the first man. But the missed extra point keeps it at a four-point game. It's nearly a chance there for Nate Stefanski. Got tripped up and gets to the 35. It seems like every time there's a little opening, every time there's a bigger play, you can feel the crowd and also both of the teams down on the field. They, they can feel how important every play here is. That missed PAT was one of those big plays. And it was tough to tell from here which way that ball deflected. It hit the top of the right upright, and the officials said it went wide. First and 10 for Drew Saxton, who threw an interception to Anthony Kennan last time. Fake handoff, tossed right, and Colt Morgan was looking upfield before he had the football, a rare mistake. That was a nice little wrinkle, I'll be honest. I haven't necessarily seen that, that motion and route combination from the Spartans yet, but I mean, it worked, it was there, just gotta, just gotta execute and make the catch. Kyle Turkovsky will check in. And as you kind of noted earlier in this game, one of the ways to win a rivalry matchup is by throwing in those little wrinkles that maybe we haven't seen throughout the year. You never know what's going to surprise the other team. And, you know, when it happens, that can grab the momentum for the rest of the game. Hall and Turkovsky as the setbacks. They look Morgan's way again, and Saxton finds him on second down. It'll be third and about four play like that, Drew Saxton knew exactly where he was going with it. He stared him down, and it still didn't matter because of, one, because of Saxton's arm strength, and two, because of the crisp route that, that was run by Morgan. And, you know, that goes back to the dog days of August and, you know, training camp, building that relationship and having that feel. He's not only been the top target, but he has been a consistent target outside the numbers for Drew this year. That's all you can ask for. You know, as a quarterback, all you want to be able to do is rely on a guy and know he's going to be in the right place at the right time. Third and four from the 41. Handoff this time. Zach Hall stacked up. He was trying to churn those legs, 
and he got stopped in his tracks by Quinn Gaughan. Coach Deblex sent the punt team out, see if he can play the field position game a little bit here. Chase Witte, his last punt went off the side of his foot and angled out, it was only about 15, 20 yards. Willie Richter is back to return. Case has transitioned this year to more of a spread punt look. You'll see the three gunners out to the top. Usually we're a tight punt team earlier in years past. And that one kind of flubbed as well by Witte. Got a semi-friendly bounce, but went more east to west than it did north to south. With, the, with it being cold like it is, that can, can feel like you're kicking a football helmet out there. It's not the easiest job, but it, you know at the end of the day, you gotta you got to trust your ability and still get the job done. This is a very silly comparison, and I will, I will open with that. But uh, my dog likes to play with her soccer ball in our backyard, and it got cold last night, and she usually can grab it with her teeth and run around with it. And she was frustrated as all get out this morning trying to grab it with her teeth because it was so hard. And it's the same thing with that football today. If Chase Woody's trying to punt, he is finding his foot meeting more of a, a concrete block than a football. Yeah, you know, you're as a football player, you're kind of jealous of, ba of basketball players. Basketball's got nice climate controlled, 70 to 75 degrees no matter what, but not football. You got to deal with the elements. Willie Richter into space, a little stiff arm, and he's wrestled out. Totally different field of the second half here as compared to the first. Both teams really, you know, moving up and down the field. A, you know, a lot more fluid. Play callers are starting to get in a rhythm here. 20-16 case. Tartan's driving. That first play from scrimmage goes from the Tartan 40 to the Spartan 38. The crowd getting into it. There's that pitch. Richter. Slam down. Got a flag on the play. Skyler Wattis on the hit. Didn't see when the flag came out. Those jet sweeps like that, it's all about leverage and all about speed. Carnegie's kind of banking on the fact that they can outrun Holding. the case defense. Offense, number 13. Ten yard penalty. First down. Got so, a great look at that. Yeah, so one of the things on defense, you know, making tackles is important. And another thing is getting off blocks so to put yourself in a good position. And part of that is, you know, if you fight off the block, they're going to have to hold you. And, you know, then it's on the referees to make the call. But Patrick Crossy there doing a great job of trying to shed the block. Coom just couldn't handle it, and he had to hold. First and 19, backed up to the 47, still in case territory. Hand off Haas. Looked like it was Tyler Bushman who got his hands on him first. Bushman really did a good job of kind of holding firm there at the point of attack, getting off the block and, you know, getting his hands on the runner, getting him to the ground. Talk about these multi-sport guys, Colt Morgan, we've touched on his former prowess as a great basketball player. Tyler Bushman, another one, former basketball and track star in high school. Still on the track team here at Case, or if not currently, he was in the past. Tossed out right side by Klein. That finds Jamie Greenwell. That is a much shorter reception than the one he had earlier. Remember in the first half, he had the bomb down the right sideline that set up Carnegie Mellon for its half-ending field goal. They used a minute and 13 to go 58 yards. And that play to Greenwell was the highlight. Winding down in the third quarter. Spartans leading 20 to 16. Carnegie Mellon driving. Klein on third and seven. Haas will take it. Trying to spin away, he won't get enough. Isaac Withrow helping out on the tackle. Again, kind of in that in-between area of the field. We'll, we'll see what Carnegie Mellon chooses to do here. It looks like they're gonna keep the offense out for the time being. And one thing you gotta watch here with it being Fourth and under five yards, you really got to pay attention to the ball and not jump off sides because that's going to give them an automatic first down. We'll see if Carnegie goes with an actual play here, just tries to draw the defense off sides. It's fourth and two. They'll run a play. It's to Haas. He gets stuffed. 
and the Spartans get a turnover on downs. No, sir. You see Coach Miller out there almost all the way to the numbers. Juiced up about his defense. It's a huge play. You know, that's kind of mano y mano. It's, you know, there's going to be a guy right in your face, and you're going to have to make the choice if you want it more than he does. Withrow, Bushman, Carney all on the stop. Spartans football. Real encouraging to see the swarm of defense there. You know, any time that you have three, four hats to the ball, it's, it's going to bode well for the defense. So Case takes over, 47 seconds left in the third quarter. Here's a look at that defense and the great stop they just had. Another turnover on downs. I believe that's number two on the night. Again, penetration behind the line. And, you know, that's kind of been the name of the game for this Carnegie Mellon defense here tonight. Donald Day the third, not getting any wiggle room. This should be the last play of the third quarter if they even want to run one. Play clock's off, second down and 11. Two back set, Hall and Tarkovsky. Saxton pulling DeFrancesco in tighter. They will run a play. Roll out right. Saxton plants, fires, incomplete, and DeFrancesco with a little shove at the end. That's the end of the third period. It won't get called. Luke DeFrancesco shoving Nick Sizik there. And Carnegie Mellon wanted a call. They won't get one. So at the end of three quarters, we've got a tight one in the 33rd Academic Bowl. Case 20, Carnegie Mellon 16. With 31 unique creations to choose from, there's something for everyone to love at Dave's Cosmic Subs. Meat lovers, vegetarians, and everyone in between agree that our freshly baked bread, high quality ingredients, and homemade sauces make us the best in Cleveland. Come on into Dave's Cosmic Subs Coventry to experience legendary subs in a cosmic atmosphere. And don't forget, we deliver. It's as easy as dialing 216-320-0330. Be the hit of the party. Order Dave's. Back for the fourth quarter at DeSanto Field. Case 20, Carnegie Mellon 16 in the 33rd Annual Academic Bowl. Back for the fourth quarter, presented by Enova. Third and 11 from the 29 for Drew Saxon in his own territory. Been a tough game for both offenses. They've been running uphill. Looking right now, Case is only at 59 yards rushing on the night, well below their se season average. Saxton at 205 yards through the air, one touchdown. He gets flushed out there and sacked for the fourth time tonight. Again, not just one guy in the backfield there collapsing the pocket. It's two, three, four guys for Carnegie Mellon able to get off their blocks, get home to the quarterback. Really been impressed with how they've been playing tonight. Four sacks, an interception. This sack to set up fourth down. And they have held Drew Saxton, who's averaging over 60% through the air this year. They've held him to under 50%. Season average is over 65% coming into today. Richter flubs the punt, and Carnegie Mellon falls on it. You know, even though Case didn't end up with the ball there, it was a pretty important play. It was important that Witte got off a better, you know, a better punt than he's had earlier in the game. And, you know, if he ripped off one of those 10, 15 yarders, there was going to be a field position problem. So he got it across midfield, and we'll see what Case's defense has got. They've kind of been on their heels a little bit here in the second half. It's, you know, it's time for someone to step up. Kevin Chrisis, Ian Henderson, Cam Brown, you know, some of the seniors, veterans on this defense. We'll see what they got. There's that defensive front line for the Spartans. Ian Henderson in the center. Back from an injury, just missed a couple of series. Also have Jason Lockamy out there. Was, you know, wasn't on the team last year, came back, has made an impact, has been a part of one of the better D lines in the conference. Lockamy to the left, Brown to the right. Hand off Haas. Gets into the defensive secondary. And that was a pretty decent gain. He'll get eight on that carry. Getting eight out of that's pretty impressive. Henderson, Lockamy, you know, Case had a couple guys penetrating there. And 
looked like Carnegie got, Carnegie got to the second level a little bit, picked up some linebackers, and that's how they were able to scrape out eight yards there. Second and two from the 45. Boom in motion, hand off Haas. He'll slide through for a first down and he's been tough to bring down out to the 30 and you've got to think that Warren Miller is frustrated with the tackling right now. I was just going to say, if there's one thing that'll really get the blood boiling of a defensive coordinator, it's missed tackles, yards after contact. You know, on the other side, if you're an offensive coach, you don't want your guys going down with arm tackles or the first guy. You want to be dragging people and that's exactly what Haas has been able to do tonight. There's Willie Richter. The center, Benjamin Almack over the ball. And a big sack by Brian Victor. Tell you what, Brian Victor powers through the running back. You'll see here on the replay. Haas, you know, been running real well tonight, wasn't able to get the block done there. And then, you know, that's part of being an all around back. You got to be able to protect your quarterback in the passing game. Victor, you know, didn't really care who was going to be in front of him there. Didn't let one guy block him and able to come up with a huge sack. Put Carnegie Mellon in second and long here. His fourth sack of the year for the sophomore out of Canton, Michigan. Second and 18 from the 39. Crowd buzzing. Haas sweeping left. Henderson drops him, but a flag flies. I'll say this. We saw earlier... Klein pull one of the, you know, one of the read options out and kind of spit out the back for about 10, 15 yards. Case's defense is really starting to crash hard on those, on those runs plays. I wouldn't be surprised if they kind of Holding come back to that. Offense number 85, 10 yard penalty, replay second down. Holdings on the senior Alex Miller. So after they picked up a few yards, not that many on that sweep. Now they'll drop back again. See what the official spot is to the 49 with a first down stick is at the 21. You know, we got about second in Cleveland Heights here, so we'll see what they can pull out of the bag of tricks. Klein in the shotgun. Dropping back, good pocket. Dropped by Miller. Right after he committed the penalty, he gets a chance crossing across, crossing through the middle, and on third and 28, he drops it. Or on second and 28, now third and 28. Now, if I had to guess, Carnegie Mellon's kind of looking at this. Is they, they have two plays here to go 28 yards. So I'm not necessarily sure they're going to take a shot and try and get it all in one, you know, one play here. I would guess that they're kind of looking at it as a two, you know, two-play set here. Do you think it's four down territory for them in a four point game with this much time left in the fourth quarter? Clock? I think in this area of the field it absolutely is. If they're backed up, then probably not, but there's kind of this middle of the road again. So third and 28 from the 49. Klein drops back, lots of time. Deep ball coming, incomplete. Well, they went for it, trying to get Greenwell. He's been the deep ball target, but a little bit too short for him. Carnegie bringing out the punt team. We haven't seen a haven't seen a ton of them today. Justin Fan back to return, and you know, could be a big field position thing here. Carnegie's punter's been doing a pretty good job of getting some good hang time on it. Hasn't been a whole lot of wiggle room there for Fan back there on the returns. We'll see if see if he's able to find anything on this one. Fan is back to about the 18. Chris Tawanek, the junior out of Clinton, New Jersey. Took over for Josh Lyons in week seven. And that one took at least an advantageous roll for Carnegie Mellon, but it didn't start out great for the Tartans. Tell you what, off the foot, that looked like a real clunker, and he was able to roll it inside the 20-yard line there. So Saxon coming back out with the offense, and four-score game, this or four-point game. This is, this is where Saxon's got to be a leader and get his offense moving. You know, it's been tough sledding so far, but that can all change here with a good drive. This is a pretty good test for a freshman quarterback in a for sure must win game. And of course, in a rivalry context, they're all must wins. But if Case wins, they are UAA champs and they share the PAC title. And if they lose, they have absolutely no chance at an at-large bid, which is something that 
we can talk a lot about. It's going to be tough sledding for Case to get that at-large bid, knowing that they they don't get the automatic qualifying bid, of course, with West uh, Washington and Jefferson winning earlier today and some of the teams they'd have to battle with for an at-large winning today. Saxton, a little pump fake going to Morgan too far. DB did not bite on that play. Uh, you know, Kennan staying disciplined, you know, kind of keeping everything in front of him, realizing I think they've run it probably twice, run that play twice earlier in the game. And like I said, stay disciplined, wasn't fooled at all. He leads this team and passes broken up. A young man out of Lancaster, Massachusetts. They've got a couple of DBs, him and Paluchko from Mass. Third and eight inside their own 20. Spartans up by four. Saxton over the middle. First down, Joey Spitali. The wily vet runs solid routes, great hands, really just an all-around receiver, willing to block in the run game. You know, it's good to see him get a target here and come through for the team. That's a big pass and a big catch by that man, Joey Spitali, at the top of your screen. First and 10 from the 33. Keeps the drive going and the clock moving. Hall wrapped up. Quick tackle by Quinn Gunn, one of the leaders of this linebacking core. Let's talk a little bit, Andrew, about the playoff picture. How difficult do you think it's going to be for the Spartans to get an at-large bid in the NCAA tournament, knowing everything that's transpired today across the country? It's going to be tough. So obviously W&J scooped up that automatic playoff bid from the PAC conference. And so Case was kind of looking up at a couple people for an at-large bid. Uh, some of the schools ahead of them, Muhlenberg, Center, Hardin-Simmons down in Texas. Case was really hoping that they were you know, going to get caught today and get upset, but that didn't happen. All three of those teams did win, which makes it, you know, incredibly difficult for Case to get in. Even at 9-1, and one, even with the blowouts that they've had, it's it's going to be an uphill battle. Um, you know, again, first and foremost, they have to win this game, but if at all possible, they can kind of put on a little bit of a show and show the voting committee what they're made of, then, you know, anything can happen. And especially last year, Case got one of the at-large bids, went out and beat Illinois Wesleyan on the road. Big upset. And, you know, so that, that sticks in the minds of the committee. They gave them a shot last year, and they came through on it. So we'll see what happens. On third and 11, Saxton is hit from behind as he throws. So it'll be fourth down, and the punting unit's going to come out. Again, getting to the quarterback, affecting the timing of everything. you got to think at some point it's going to get in the back of Saxton's head and you start getting happy feet a little bit back there. And It seems like Carnegie Mellon has made a conscious effort to get after the quarterback tonight, and that's exactly what they're doing. He seemed so comfortable in the first half evading those oncoming rushers and he just hasn't been able to so much, really from the middle of the second quarter on. Witty spiral punt, fielded by Richter. A little bit of over-pursuit there, and Richter has a chance for a decent return. He'll get out past midfield near the 40. He'll spot it at the 44, maybe 43 and a half. Spartans defense got to rise up again. We'll see what they're made of here. There's a little tiny over-pursuit and a nice job by Richter to cut it back knowing that he had the space to his left. Almost a little face mask there, too, at the end. Special teams, it's all about staying in your lane, trusting that the other guys are going to get their job done. And, you know, when you get a little greedy, stuff like that can happen, and they can bust out a little bit. Spots on the 43. We talked about last year being one of the great matchups in this rivalry's history. An overtime thriller. Pass. Here's a little wrinkle. For Klein, he's got it. And that's a first down. How about that? There it is, digging deep. J.D. Dayhuff is the backup quarterback and lines up at wide receiver. And how about the hands from Klein to go grab that down low? Big play, picked up the first down. I will say Schuster was on that side of the field, so probably not at any point. It wasn't going to go for a touchdown, but, I mean, hey, it, in a game like this, any first down you can get is huge, huge. Start moving the clock, start moving those chains. Coom in motion, hand off, Haas. Not as much to be had on the ground. 
at least on this drive. One thing to keep in mind here, four-point game, they did miss an extra point. Okay, so if they go and kick a field goal, they're still going to be down versus being tied if they were able to execute earlier. It's now second and eight from the 29. That was a big missed extra point. Not a block, and that's the the first miss by Nguyen that wasn't a block. So far this year, his freshman campaign, 26 of 27. He was blocked last week in a heartbreaking loss against Westminster. Second and eight. Klein going for it all. Carl Coombe in for six. And the lead for the Tartans. Josh Smith is down. Watch Coombe tiptoeing. And yes, he did get in. And then it looked like Coombe fell on top of Smith's head. And he's okay. He's getting up. But he was down for a second there. What a play. You know, Klein has stood in there. has been pressure in his face all night. Drops another dime in there to the, you know, the guy we've been talking about the whole time, to Coombe. He's involved in every single play. I don't know how he doesn't get tired. He's in motion every single play, blocking, getting in with the nasties, and comes up huge for Carnegie Mellon and puts him ahead. This to make it a three-point Carnegie Mellon lead. It would, well, it's good. And it's the first lead for Carnegie Mellon tonight. They lead 23 to 20, and we might have another classic on our hands as we wind down in the fourth quarter from DeSanto Field. Intercontinental Suites has been transformed into much more than a hotel. It is a center of wellness and tranquility, featuring renovated suites, an expanded fitness center, and pure rooms for guests requiring the most allergen-resistant rooms on the market. C2, our Mediterranean-style restaurant and bar, accentuates the ambiance of relaxation and rejuvenation. Chef Omar Jones has designed a menu full of fresh, locally grown herbs and vegetables, along with a flavorful cuisine inspired by the beneficial Mediterranean diet. Call the Intercontinental today at 216-707-4. 300 or visit us at hotelscleelandclinic.com or on Facebook. Carnegie Mellon leads for the first time in this game thanks to a beautiful pass. Alex Klein connecting to Carl Coombe. And it's the Tartans 23 and the Spartans 20 at the 33rd Annual Academic Bowl. Can't help but think back into the first half. Case was driving twice into Carnegie Mellon territory. Only came away with, only came away with field goals. And, you know, look where we stand now. Well, now on the return. This is Stefanski out to the 24. A reminder that the Holiday Inn Cleveland Clinic is the preferred partner of Case Western Reserve University Athletics. Mention CWRU teams when booking your next stay. 8.17 left to go in regulation. Drew Saxton needs to orchestrate a comeback drive. He has not had to do that much this year. Certainly hasn't had to do it in the fourth quarter. First and 10 from the 25. Saxton drops back. Goes near side. Incomplete to Colt Morgan. Spartans think he got that right heel in. Let's take a look. Tough to see. Definitely caught it. It's just all about the foot positioning at the bottom there. One thing I will say about Saxton, you know, it seems like he's pretty unfazed when stuff like that happens. He just keeps slinging, and that's, you know, that's a hallmark of any good, successful quarterback, so it's impressive to see that as, at a young age from him. Second and 10 from the 25. Saxton goes right side, too tall and complete. Go back a couple years, 2016, when the Spartans had the end of their season spoiled by a tight loss to Carnegie Mellon. Don't think that, especially the seniors in this team, aren't thinking about that a little bit. 13 seniors celebrating their final game on this field, and maybe their final game as a Spartan, depending on a potential at-large bid. They can't get that without a comeback. Third and 10. Saxton, deep ball, right side. Caught 
down the sideline, Luke DeFrancesco. One man to beat. Down at the one. Huge play, Saxon dropping it in. DeFrancisco just couldn't finish it, does not matter. Down to the, looks like two yard line. Again, that, I mean, that is by far the biggest play that the Spartans have had in the second half. Really a tremendous effort by the Carnegie Mellon defender to catch him. Looked like he might have been close. Nothing you can do about it now. Just got to find a way into the end zone. DeFrancesco coming up a little lame there. The old man, the wily vet, finding a way to get it done. Credit Nick Sizek for chasing him down. Ball spotted at the two. Spartans trying to climb back in front. Tarkovsky in the backfield. They sling it to the end zone. Too far, incomplete, looking for Spitali. This is it. This has kind of been the, you know, the name of the game for the Spartans' office. Can they find the end zone here when they get down deep? And for Carnegie Mellon, they have bent but not broken in this situation in this game. From the two, now Donald Day the third checks in. They'll give it to him, nothing. Huge hit. Completely stoned at the two yard line. They might even be back to the, third, the three yard line. So now we have third down coming up and you know, depending on what happens here, it's gonna be decision time for Coach Debelak. They have to find the end zone here. That was Quinn Zito who came in second to make that play. Remember two years ago, Spartans trying for an undefeated season, falling to Carnegie Mellon in the final game of the year right here, 26-21. They went 9-1 instead of 10-0. Down by three late. Hand off. Day. Up the middle. Did not get it. Very close. Stacked up by Quinn Gone at the one yard line. And so once again, the kicking team's gonna come out. The Spartans had the ball at the two yard line thanks to a bomb pass and a great after first contact run by Luke DeFrancesco. And every single time, Carnegie Mellon stops the Spartans just short. Albrecht for the tie. And we're even. Now how big was that missed PAT earlier in the game? If not for that, Carnegie Mellon would be up by one. Instead, 23-23 as we tick down in the fourth quarter. With 31 unique creations to choose from, there's something for everyone to love at Dave's Cosmic Subs. Meat lovers, vegetarians, and everyone in between agree that our freshly baked bread, high quality ingredients, and homemade sauces make us the best in Cleveland. Come on into Dave's Cosmic Subs Coventry to experience legendary subs in a cosmic atmosphere. And don't forget, we deliver. It's as easy as dialing 216-320-0330. Be the hit of the party, order Dave's. Well, after the game, you can stick around for the post-game show brought to you by the Courtyard Marriott University Circle. Don't know when that'll be. Case and Carnegie Mellon tied at 23 with under six minutes left to play in the fourth quarter. Willie Richter fielding that punt or fielding that uh, kickoff by Albrecht who just tied it with a short chip field goal. And Richter gets out to about the 26, 27 yard line. Another grand defensive stand by Carnegie Mellon backed up to the two yard line and a case team that almost always gets the nose of the football across the goal line especially when they're in the red zone stopped again Andrew Rossman yeah you you have to think the two sidelines have very different feels right now if you're Carnegie Mellon you say wow this is exactly where we wanted to be having the ball tie game in the fourth quarter and on the opposite side Cases maybe, you know, getting a little nervous. This game should not be this close. They're heavy favorites coming in, and here we are. So here is Haas on the run. By the way, coming into today, the Spartans, when they're in the red zone, operating, like we've said today, about 
30 touchdowns, six field goals. Case, today, they have now kicked their third field goal of the night and the only touchdown pass to Colt Morgan. It's been the only offensive Spartan touchdown today. Other touchdown by Kevin Chrisis. Here's Haas on second and seven. Or Richter, excuse me. What a great game though, you know? I mean, from a rivalry game standpoint, from a regular game standpoint, no matter who is involved, back and forth, we've had turnovers, big plays, big calls. I mean, across the board, what else could you ask for in November football? It really couldn't be much better. And for November football, this is great weather too. We'll take third it. And, third and three from the 34. Haas, up the middle, he slides through. And a little ankle tackle there by Colin Schuster. Haas continuing to find running room. The big guy's up front creating holes for him, and he's hitting them. Schuster there, able to get him on the ground. Kind of got taken for a ride a little bit, but, you know, the tackle is all that matters at the end of the day. That brings it out to midfield, and this ground game by Carnegie Mellon has been something else. This isn't usually their M.O. Klein, wide open, Willie Richter. Shifting and shaking inside the 25. And it, we are going to have an eligible man downfield. One of the linemen got a little too excited. Coming back. Well, not often do you see Willie Richter that far open. But the flag brings it back to Carnegie Mellon's own 45. Yeah, it's a great example of Carnegie's been pounding the ball that direction, pounding the ball, pounding the ball to Haas, and then they finally pull it out. We said, we've been saying all night, we're waiting for him to come back the other way, and there it was. Unfortunately, had the penalty, marched him back. We'll see what they can come up with here, first and 15. Last year's game went to overtime. Spartans won. A great drive orchestrated by Rob Kuda. Fourth down conversion. That's tipped, incomplete. Colin Schuster tried to dive back to it, couldn't get it. I'll say this, having Cam Brown run at your full speed has got to be a terrifying sight. It was amazing Klein was even able to get that throw off and have it be anywhere near the receiver. But again, Cam Brown forcing the issue, getting home to the quarterback and you know just being disruptive in general. One of the most menacing linemen in all Division Three football this year, second in D3 in sacks per game, averaging a sack and a half per game. Second and 15. Klein stepping up. He is sacked. Defense rising up. You know, both sides we've seen, if you... If you really want to be successful defensively in this game, you're going to have to get after the quarterback. When they can sit back there and kind of take their time, the receivers find a way to get open. But if you can get pressure on them, whether it's from the DBs, the linemen, the linebackers, that's really going to be your bread and butter for disruption. Brett Carney, along with Andrew Lease on the sack. Talk about that game last year. Rob Kuda with a big fourth down conversion in overtime. Justin Fan with a touchdown catch to win it. After a frenetic finish in the fourth quarter, we've got another tight one in the fourth this year. Klein over the middle on third and long. Not enough, but probably enough to try for fourth down in this area of the field. Let's see what they do. Alex Miller on the catch, the tight end. Fourth down and about four to go. Markers at the 40. Empty. We haven't seen a whole lot of this. A whole lot of this tonight. We'll see if they motion out of it. Here he comes. Alex Klein now adjusting his protection from what he sees on the Spartan front seven. Only seven on the play clock. They might take a timeout to think about this. They might have to. Two seconds and one on the play clock. Timeout called. Just in time. 
looking at the clock, you know, we have a minute 52 left here. Tie game. Carnegie gets this. They're definitely set up to go in, potentially kick a game-winning field goal. And, of course, if they don't get it, then you're in a situation where Case has a short field. So how much do you measure the pros versus the cons here? It's a, it's a short uh, amount of yards to gain, fourth and four, but the, the risk-reward might be a little outbalanced. Yeah, I think in a case like this with a team, especially like Carnegie Mellon, not necessarily in the playoff hunt, what do they have to lose? You're definitely playing to win. Playing for the win versus, you know, playing not to lose, I would say, is kind of the mentality. So, especially in this part of the field, you're, you've got to go for it. You have to. You have to trust that your guys are going to execute. They've had a lot of success here in the second half, especially, I mean, if you look at it, it's only four, maybe five yards. you got to trust that your guys are going to be able to get the job done here. And they send the punt team out. So, you know, sometimes we in the booth <laughs> can make our guesses and coaches throw a little wrinkle at you. So, they're going to they're gonna punt the ball away and trust their defense and – you know, honestly, maybe try and get the ball back and, you know, see what they can do with what little time will be left. A guess is a guess, and that's why you won't find me at the casino. <laughs> so here is Chris Tawanek to punt it, presumably. Justin Fan back to return. And referees on the sidelines comparing dinner plans with Coach Deblack. What do you suppose they are discussing here? Um... It almost looks like an equipment. Test, test, one, two, test, test. I think we just figured it out. There we go. The ref mic. And we're back. Justin Fan, if you'll remember, against Chicago in 2016, 85-yard touchdown return on a punt. D3 play of the week. We'll see if he can drum up another one of those. They are going to punt it as far away from him as possible, and it is a darn good one by Chris Tawanek to the nine-yard line. So how about the field position game now? i got to say, special teams for Carnegie Mellon have been impressive. Nailed a 45-yard field goal at the end of the first half. Went with the pitching wedge there and nestled it down at the nine-yard line. We'll see. You know, like we've been saying the whole second half, someone on offense for Case needs to step up. Last drive, it was Luke DeFrancisco coming up with the big play, the big catch down the sideline. They got another chance here. That's a team after your own heart with the special teams. Absolutely. Always a special place for the special teamers out there. We love you guys. First and 10 from their own nine. Saxton under duress and dropped again. For the fifth time in this game. Second and 16. An inauspicious start to this drive. Michael Lohmeyer on the sack. And now if you're Carnegie, you got them down here, backed up in their own end zone, you can really start to attack. And, you know, you don't want to look ahead too far, but hopefully you're going to get Case to punt out of this if you can get him to go three and out here and then really have a nice field position set up for what could be potentially a game-winning score. Kyle Tarkovsky in the backfield, now under a minute to play in regulation. Looks like Coach Debelak might be playing for overtime here. Saxton in his own end zone. Gets rid of it over the middle. It is caught near the first down. Maybe a half yard short. DeFrancesco looks like he's right at the yard to gain. And they'll move the chains. Clock stops to move the chains. Case with all three timeouts left. First 31 seconds left. Saxton on the give. Turkovsky looking for a hole. He gets brought down, and I think you're right. Spartans look like they're playing for overtime, but Carnegie Case. Mellon. No, Case calling it's the first. timeout. So they want to think about this. Well, we, we kind of thought along the same lines in the first half, and look what happened, Andrew. We saw Carnegie Mellon drive down and put some points on the board. Yeah, I mean, you know, as we saw with Mellon in the first half, it can – it can evolve from you're just trying to run the clock out and you know play for second half or play for overtime in this case. And a guy can score through, get you 20 yards, and that totally changes your mindset. Again, with it being a tie game, any score here will win the game. So, you know, we'll take a field goal at this point. Uh, you're probably going to have to get down to, I would say, the opponent's 30-yard line to have a shot at that. So still quite a ways to go, can flip quickly. As, I mean, as long as they're not taking a knee here, they do have a chance. But we'll see. Might have some free football for us. And if you're Carnegie Mellon, 
I've got to think you're spotlighting Colt Morgan as the top target. Yeah, well, I mean, everyone in the stadium knows who the, the most productive receiver has been this year, so we'll see. We'll see what they decide to go with. Well, they'll hand it off. Turkovsky slips through. That'll stop the clock again until they reset the football. A first down, 19 seconds remaining. And they're going to go ahead and take another timeout. Timeout. Here. Case, it's second. Are you surprised at all they called the timeout there instead of just spiking the ball and stopping the clock? I, Not really. I mean, with a situation like this, you got to make every play count. If you're not comfortable, if, you know, coaches are humans too, and if they hesitate at all on their play call, then it's better to take the timeout, get yourself right, and, you know, feel confident about the play that you're going to call here. Now, what is going to be kind of, you know, what's kind of tough on defense from Carnegie's perspective is you're okay with giving up 15 yards here, and it's kind of a – a different mindset but again keep everything in front of you hopefully tackle them inbounds get the clock to run out but you're not necessarily concerned with the underneath stuff you're just worried about something you know spouting off over the top first and 10 from their own 33 spartans and tartans tied at 23 in the 33rd annual academic bowl fan in motion saxton five-man rush slips away Goes deep. Fan can't come back to it. Fan was open. Fan had gotten behind two of the defenders. Just, again, Saxton not really given a whole lot of time to stay, you know, stay in the pocket. Was running for his life a little bit back there. Didn't really look like he got his feet entirely set and didn't get everything behind that throw. Second and ten. Twelve seconds remaining. If there's one thing that we have learned in this rivalry... It's not over until it's over. So we'll see what these 12 seconds hold for us here. Saxton. Screen. DeFrancesco. Stays inbounds. Tries to get to the sticks. And he does. That'll stop the clock with three seconds left until they reset it. And the Spartans will call their final timeout. timeout. Case. Their third and final timeout of the half. So enough time for a bomb here if they want to let one go. Yeah, well, as, as they say in other circles, we're going to see the further scouts throw here. We're going to get to show it off a little bit. Unless, you know, sometimes teams here in recent years have kind of gone with more of an underneath approach to these Hail Marys. I know Kansas City Chiefs were playing at the Cowboys two years ago, and Tyreek Hill caught about a five-yard pass and turned it all the way up and, you know, turned it into a touchdown. So it's some sometimes teams, it just kind of depends on the philosophy. I I'd be a little surprised if they just try and straight, you know, bomb it up there. They might try and hit something intermediate and see if one of their playmakers can make a run at it. That kind of feels right given the the spot on the field. I mean, Saxton's got an arm, but you're asking him to really unload. Realistically, from about where he is right now, maybe at his own 40 and trying to chuck at 60 yards might be a little unrealistic. Yeah, 60 yards in this cold, it's – listen – he might pull it out. He's done some incredible things this year, but I'm a little bit skeptical. We'll see. Carnegie's put a guy all the way back on the nine-yard line, and we're just going to take a knee. That's it. So last play of regulation, anticlimactic. This game has not been. Overtime for the second year in a row in the 33rd annual Academic Bowl. Intercontinental Suites has been transformed into much more than a hotel. It is a center of wellness and tranquility, featuring renovated suites, an expanded fitness center, and pure rooms for guests requiring the most allergen-resistant rooms on the market. C2, our Mediterranean-style restaurant and bar, accentuates the ambiance of relaxation and rejuvenation. Chef Omar Jones has designed a menu full of fresh, locally grown herbs and vegetables, along with a flavorful cuisine inspired by the beneficial Mediterranean diet. Call the Intercontinental today at 216 707 300 or visit us at hotelsclevelandclinic.com or on Facebook. For the second year running, one of the most contentious rivalries in the PAC and the UAA will go to an extra stanza. Case Western Reserve University and Carnegie Mellon University meeting for the 48th time, the 33rd annual Academic Bowl and we are all knotted up going to OT. Last year was something special. Not quite the end of the fourth quarter with a 
uh, a less than exciting kneel down this year as we had last year with, oh, the, the blocked punt and the penalty, uh, the penalty parade and the last second field goal to tie by Carnegie Mellon. But certainly from quarter one to quarter four, we've had something special on our hands. Just back and forth. I mean, all night long, interceptions back and forth, long plays, great passes by the quarterbacks. Really been entertaining game from start to finish. And, you know, I have a feeling overtime is going to be just the same way. Now the overtime coin toss. Gentlemen, we'll use the same coin from the beginning of the game. Both teams will have one timeout. There's the head, there's the tail. Call it. Tails. Yeah, yeah. So it's tails. No, it's just you got to match. Offense, defense, or end of the field? Yeah, you got to match until someone doesn't You're on offense. Which end? Whoever goes first. That way? We'll go second for the Okay, switch it around. Okay. They flip the order. Gotcha. So Carnegie towards the field goal in that case. Case will be on offense yeah. at the 25-yard line. Then have a good game. So we're all set to go for the potentially first overtime. We'll see how many we need in the 33rd Annual Academic Bowl. Case Western Reserve University and Carnegie Mellon University all nodded at 23. Andrew Rossman, you've played in this rivalry before. You played in one of the greatest games in this rivalry's history. How does this one stack up? I know it's asking a lot, sitting up here, not being down there, but how does this stack up compared to last year? Well, you know, obviously Case won last year, so we're going to go ahead and put that one up here. <laughs> we'll put that one at the top of the list for now, but, I mean, anytime you get overtime in a, in a rivalry game like this with two conference titles on the line for Case, potential at-large bid, bid into the playoffs, you can't ask for much more. Drew Saxton. From the 25 to start overtime. Fan Reverse. in motion. They've had this play in their back pocket. DeFrancesco to Saxton. Too far. Looked like Saxton stopped running just enough so that the throw was a little bit out of reach. They had it. They had it. You hear the Philly special. Clemson's run it. We ran it last year at Mountain Union. You know, it's kind of the popular trick play. But, again, it was there. Just couldn't find the connection. Greg Debelak, in just a little offhanded comment after we got done with our pregame interview, which we tape on Thursday, he said, you know, we've got this play we might run. That was it. It almost worked. Second and ten. Saxton going deep. End zone. Incomplete. That is the exact play that Justin Fan scored on last year against Carnegie Mellon. You know, it's worked. He's so difficult to cover. He's so tough to even get one hand on. So, you know, credit to the Carnegie Mellon defender again. All night long, they've done a good job of, you know, staying right in the hip pocket of the case receivers. Third and ten. Sean Knight in coverage. The freshman step for step has stopped Fan a few times tonight. Top of your screen, Spitali and Fan. Bottom of your screen, DeFrancesco and Morgan. Third down in overtime. Saxton looking, going deep, batted away again. Sean Knight in coverage, step for step with Justin Fan for the second play running. Timeout, Case. Pretty much the exact same play, and again, strong coverage from the Carnegie Mellon defender. This defense by Carnegie Mellon all game long has been something to behold. You can go back to a bunch of different drives, but I'm going to go back to that stop they had on first down and goal from the two and not letting Case get in. Yeah, I mean, that's really big boy football when you get down there inside the five-yard line. It's, you know, it's who wants it more. Usually offenses are just kind of going to, they're going to hand the ball off and see if they can push people off the ball. You know, and Case wasn't able to do it. Carnegie, as they have time and again, you know, throughout the course of this game, stepped up the defensive line, made the play, and you know, they've made the plays here in overtime again, and we'll see. We'll see what they got cooked up. They've been getting pressure all night. We'll see if Saxon's able to have some time to, to work with the receivers. And what's been a bit of a disappointing year for Carnegie Mellon, 4-4, four and 4-3 four, four and three in the PAC. This would be quite a way to end it. 
Saxton rolling right, flushed out, gets rid of it. DeFrancesco, he's got it, first down. You can't teach clutch, can't teach it, look at him. You know, he's been in the program for four years, just a stud, he will not be denied on stuff like that. He's limping around, he's hurting, he's old, and he still finds a way to make the play for the Spartans. Right in front of one of the best DBs on this team, Thomas Paluchko. Four wide, Cherkovsky right next to Saxton. Looking end zone, Morgan intercepted. Anthony Kennan. What a great play by the Carnegie Mellon defender. You know, again, we said it earlier, they're gonna let the boys play tonight. Gonna let there be some contact. Questionable there. They're both, you know, both pushing, grabbing. DB just wanted it more and he came up with the ball. Anthony Kennan and Cases Kevin Chris has now each have two interceptions tonight. And Carnegie Mellon with an opportunity to win this. Any score will win it. Field goal, touchdown, whatever you please. It's on Cases defense now to, you know, to rise up and get the ball back to their offense. This would be a massive upset, and it would be a devastating way to finish the season for Case. It would totally erase any opportunity for them to get into the NCAA tournament. And they wouldn't win the PAC or the UAA. Haas, off tackle left, gets the edge, shoved out near the first down marker. Patrick Crossy looked like he had a shot there. House is able to outrun him and get the corner and pick up the first down. Winner of this game, I'll remind you, will win the UAA outright. Second and two from the 17. And the thing to keep in mind, you know, Carnegie hit a 45-yard field goal earlier in this game. They are already in range based on that. So, you know, again, different coaching philosophies. Some guys might try and just, you know, center the ball here and play for the field goal, and others are going to go for the juggler and try and get the touchdown. We'll see what they go with. Brandon Nguyen, their kicker, hit from 45, as you said earlier. He's hit from 37 last week. Haas has the first down, and now they're well within range to the 10. They give up a touchdown, you know, the kicking doesn't matter. That'll be, that'll be the ball game. So, Case with their, with their backs to the wall here, see if they can find a way to get it done. A back and forth contest. Carnegie Mellon clawing their way into a 23-20 lead before Robertson Albrecht's field goal tied it late in the fourth quarter. Now into overtime. Haas slipping through, fighting to the goal line. Touchdown. Carnegie Mellon are UAA champions. Fittingly, Chris Haas, who was the lead running back, replacing the injured Roy Hubbard and carried so much of the workload tonight Wins it for the Tartans in overtime. Like you said, Haas, from the beginning of the game, workhorse, ran hard, was able to find one more run there and, you know, win the game for the Tartans. Carnegie Mellon wins the UAA. They upset number 19, Case Western Reserve University, and they win the 33rd Annual Academic Bowl.